So the major deal here, this is a slide um, looking at the high-risk myeloma with total therapy too. We know that, that not everybody, fortunately, is dying and relapsing, but there is a very definite little shoulder plateau, even 10%. And we want to know who are these folk, right? It's important to distinguish them. And we did find a gene that distinguished them, and it was a P53-related gene. And so this kind of work goes on in order to peel off the onion these subsets that even within high risk can do better. PET scanning, it looks like melanoma on the skin. If you actually, you can get the PET scan on your right with a Christmas tree or Rosh, what, what is your Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah, right? If you wanna be, wanna be correct here, you can't, you know, and this diversity week, and I talked yesterday in the diversity session, and I practice it today again. So this person could have stage one asymptomatic myeloma. It does happen. We have seen this. Have you seen that too? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that is not so nice to have. So we actually do this. And then we see that when we have the information on the PET scan and the gene array, and do the PET scan at baseline and after two cycles of induction therapy before the transplant. And if the lights go out the end of Christmas, then that high risk population in green does as well as low risk disease. That's an important consideration that ought to be taken into account and it confirms studies in lymphoma where in Hodgkin disease where this has been done. Um, so the high-risk disease is the major sucker that needs to be conquered. And you can see here uh, the high-risk disease defined by gene array that with total therapy two with and without thalidomide, 3A and B, there has not been an iota of progress, at least in a fashion if you are being treated the way we do it. Others say, well, if you just didn't treat, you might be better off. And I've actually considered this, and I'll give you some notion. There are several patients who have smoldering myeloma, who have even cytogenetic abnormalities, but they are symptom-free. And we do the gene array, and they have bad features. But I'm trying to test how long are they actually hanging out there, because one argument against my philosophy could be that as you wiggle with the apple cart, you know, you set something in motion that you can no longer control, right? And that ought to be tested. I learned from my boss, Dr. Freireich, that you need to be an extremist. Either you do super hard or not at all because otherwise you cannot discover anything. If it's a little bit, a 10 or 20% difference, you will not discover anything. I was gonna use a four letter. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So then we ask the question, where in the treatment program does this escape from, control, from disease control happen? If you focus on that little oval here, it looks at high-risk disease in two different studies. It goes from in induction to first transplant, first the second transplant, and so it goes from right, left to right, and so on. And you can see virtually in every circumstance where there is no treatment, there's relapse of this nasty 15% of patient disease. But those who don't ever measure it, don't even know what, it, what, what I'm talking about. It has to, the data have to be interpreted in the proper context. So based on this and learning from cancer in general, the NIH under Dr. Who does the dose dense uh, program at the NCI in the blocking on his name. He works with, with Rich Little. So they, in high-risk, high-grade lymphoma, they decided 
it's more important to give the treatment continuously. They reduce the dose so they could come in in, on a, in a timely fashion. And patients didn't get so ill that they had to stop treatment, they had to recover from all the side effects. And that's what we are trying to pursue in our current program for total therapy, for, uh, for high-risk disease in total therapy five. And this slide shows you yet another facet of our work and we have begun several years ago not only to measure the gene array of the purified myeloma cells, but also of the entire marrow in order to account for the neighborhood or the microenvironment, the stroma in which those myeloma cells live. It's very clear if you go to a fine capital hotel and Dr. Rajkumar will be leaving this afternoon and you can go into his room, it looks perfectly clean. Had you, on the other hand, some, uh, I'm not using me as an example because I'm also tidy, but you know, some others leave crap behind. You know when somebody nasty was in the neighborhood. And this is the same with the microenvironment in myeloma. So the myeloma cells can exploit the surrounding tissue cells, the fibroblasts, the endothelial cells, the osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and they engage them, like Gaddafi needs his henchmen to do the job. And when then the myeloma is gone, our postulate is, when it was nasty, it will take much longer to normalize, to clean up. And in a non-nasty fashion, it remains clean. And support for this comes from this slide. We have now begun normal donors, and everybody in the audience over age 60 can get a gene array in an hour. And Bonnie, please uh, sign everybody up, because we need normal donors. So here are normal donors. Home bone marrow biopsy. Here's MDAS, that is the precursor lesion. So these genes here, these are that many, 10 people or so, and 20 people here, and these are different genes organized in the rows. These are expressed in a low fashion, these are hot, hyper expressed. And this is myeloma, this is focal lesion growth, and this, these are people with continued remission in total therapy one. And you can see when you look the, across, you can see some of these guys here look almost like these guys, right? The top genes are blue and the bottom ones are red and there are some that are still abnormal. So there are two important issues here. One is that MGUS in this comparison in terms of the neighborhood looks much more like normal whereas myeloma does not. And we are trying to get data for this so that this actually comes out and is statistic, statistically valid. And then we are trying to find the proteins and something that gets secreted and hopefully can identify this with a simple blood test, but that needs more money, Steve and Nancy. <laughs> okay. So, and then we want to use this examination in complete remission or even in partial remission as a potential yardstick surrogate for whether we are close to curing this particular patient with the hypothesis being when everything is totally normal in the microenvironment, the patient is at very low risk. And it has to be done probably because of the heterogeneity. I suggest, uh, uh, so that we do bilateral bone marrow biopsies so that we also have an internal control and are not, uh, by the New England Journal Review, and say, well, how about the, uh, you know, the uh, variation in a given patient, right? So we do this reading in to, uh, today, Bonnie. <laughs> and, okay, now I, let, let me, I think I've said what I needed to say, and uh, this is actually in recognition of the grand sitting here in the center of the front row. They should actually be sitting on separate comfort, on ottomans. 
Dr. McCool, you know what Ottomans are. Where are you? Here. Okay. Next time. And what they supported was proteomics research. And this slide made by Christoph Hoek and showing the results that uh, Ricky Edmondson and John Shaughnessy produced shows that there is now a convergence of gene array data and proteomics with very separate approaches identifying genes on chromosome 1Q that are copy number driven and this particular gene CACYBP distinguishes based on protein and secreted products and gene array this high-risk disease and it will be targeted. Thank you. And no, wait, I, I now I have to go to the case. So uh, the case here is, uh, you know, other questions relevant. So the first question is, I would say answer is none of the above because it depends on whether or not the kidney failure is reversible. So one cannot just say, well, you know, it just, you, you get more information as you walk along. You cannot say with a little stuff in the front and then make big uh, prophecies about anything. They are prophets, but you know you also want to be right, right? I mean, you know, otherwise they they clash. And the second thing is based if this patient has high risk based on genery, which is uh, suggested because of the PET scan, because of P53 deletion, etc. Then indeed I would give this person BTDAs, avoiding the platinum, it does often bring about complete remissions within one cycle in our experience. One can collect plenty of stem cells, and then the issue is what you do. So, you know, we, we also see, uh, you know, a concern, is there some cardiac amyloidosis in a person like this? All of these nitty lit, little things, we are not doing here medicine in Mayo or here, that is just sort of for the average. We are doing highly sophisticated, innovative research in order to change the practice of medicine. And the third one is it depends again on what the people have and I want to thank everybody and this is actually a little note by San Miguel who acknowledges here in this comment that it's there's a certain the benefit of treatment in low-risk patients was recently demonstrated. The risk of under-treating low-risk patients by then concluding they are already in conventional CR could be a serious error if cure is the goal. It is, I'm not saying that people need a transplant to get the results that we have accomplished, but if we as an institution where we have had steady progress leave this all of a sudden totally hanging but what the what the backbone of the transplant assures us is that we won't destroy this trajectory and others are there now to evaluate whether one can do without anything and I think we will you will see we are pretty much in line and I thank you and we are the people helping us and philanthropy. I put the grants, depending on the way I talk, the grants go first or the, the balls go first. That depends uh, who's in the audience, yeah. as you would imagine, right? Yeah. Thank you.